Ben, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. You bet. <laughs> We've been a big fan for you for so many years. You know that I had an honor to see you at the Daily Wire offices in LA at the time. I wanted to kind of pick your brain on, on you know, the situation that's going on here in Israel with Hamas, the Israeli Arabs, but we can really start with, what do you think Biden's thesis is to the situation and to, to the entire conflict in a sense, right? In the beginning, you know, we felt like he's given more of a leeway to the Israeli government, but now we're starting to read that the U.S. is pushing to some sort of a ceasefire to kind of slow down on, on sort of, are you disappointed or what do you think of that? I mean, frankly, I was kind of astonished that he gave Israel as much space as he did, considering the orientation of the Democratic Party, which has moved pretty dramatically against Israel over the course of time. And I was at the DNC in 2012 when the DNC came very close to taking Jerusalem as Israel's capital out of its out of its platform. Uh, and since then, the party's gotten significantly more anti-Israel with the squad, with with open anti-Semitic Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. Uh, and now you'd have to include Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez in that, considering the sort of legwork she's been doing for Hamas. Uh, and that's, you know, the, the fact that Biden stood up to that for as long as he did is kind of astonishing to me, especially given the way that he was orienting himself toward the Middle East generally. He, he was seeking to kind of reinforce status quo ante, go back to what was under Barack Obama. He was trying to reach out to Iran, which of course is the sponsor state for, for Hamas. He was trying to reinstate hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to the UNRWA, which is a propaganda and, uh, and terror support outlet for the Palestinian Authority and for Hamas. Uh, he was trying to restore foreign aid to the Palestinian Authority in violation of the Taylor Force Act, right? All, all these actions bespeak somebody who uh, was going to put significant pressure on Israel. Uh, and he seems to have put some pressure on Israel, but not nearly as sort of loud and, and vocal and nastily as I thought that he probably would or, or that Barack Obama would have, certainly. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and um, you know, we were surprised there in Israel as well about that. Um, but at the same time, when, when you look at Hamas and, you know, what even more scary to us Israeli now, to, in a certain extent, is, is what's going on with the Israeli Arab. What do you think the solution is? Uh, you know, we, we see some, so, you know, so-called celebrities uh, actually screaming and chanting from the rivers to the sea. Uh, they basically, which some of the conversation I've had with celebrities in the U.S., most of them you'd be surprised they don't even know what they're talking about. They're sharing stuff. They, you know, they have all this plat. They have this huge platform. And and, and um, but what, what do you think the solution is? What, what do you because you know the left always have a solution, right? It's two state solution. We got to do this. We got to do this. But I feel like you know the argument from the right has not been sufficient enough to to say okay, this is what we're going to do, and this is how it's going to work. Well, uh, so a couple of things. One, I definitely would not be surprised how ignorant celebrities are. They're they are some of the stupidest people on earth, and they literally know nothing about this conflict or pretty much anything else. So watching various Hollywood celebrities like Joaquin Phoenix sound off on things is uh, is not only useless, it's counterproductive. Um, as far as the solution, the answer is there is no solution, which everybody who's been watching this knows, because until one side recognizes that the other side exists, there's not going to be a solution. Israel has no interest as a society or as a country in a heavy ground invasion of, of Gaza for any prolonged period of time. Toppling Hamas would presumably lead to the rise of Palestinian Islamic Jihad or to Fatah or to a second layer of Hamas. Uh, and so barring some sort of full military reoccupation of Gaza, for which there's very little sentimental, uh, sentimental uh, desire, um, I, I don't see any sort of solution other than what seems to be you know, the sporadic going in, wrecking their military capacity for a couple of years, and then dealing with whatever comes down the road. It also happens to be the case that Iron Dome has sort of forestalled the inevitable here, which is that right. because of Iron Dome, the Israeli army has been able to hold off in taking severe and significant measures uh, because the number of Israeli casualties is so low because Iron Dome is so effective. And there's a reason that Hezbollah has stayed out of this conflict, and that is because if Hezbollah were to get into the conflict and start firing 150,000 rockets over the northern border, at that point, the IDF would just be unleashed and every single person in the arena knows it. All the leaders know it. The United States knows it. Like that, that Once you're putting you know, tens of thousands of Israelis under actual existential threat, then the IDF has no, no ability other than full-scale ground invasion, top-down war, uh, uh, none of this pinpoint attacking infrastructure routine. You know, it'd be it'd be you know, a total war at that point because it's a war for survival. And I think everybody knows right. that, including Hezbollah, which is why they didn't try to do this at this point. Yeah, it's 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 pretty um, evident to, to us Israelis that, you know, one side obviously, you know, 
unfortunately one is dead and 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 been declaring it even though there are some voices within the arab community to come into coexistence etc but you know one thing is it's it's interesting to me when when i read about the conflict etc is, is that the, the rafiah border with you know basically gaza has obviously as you know two borders one one is with israel the other one with egypt i wonder why the us and israel are not putting more pressure on egypt um to open rafiah and essentially uh get all you know masses of, of of people out of of gaza or at least the ones from us would let get out of gaza but let them at least get out to egypt and then from there obviously europe or other places around the world but at least get the inflammation out and then things will at least to a certain extent going to be able to kind of withstand well this has been a this has been a long time problem i mean the, the reality is that with the establishment of the state of israel there were some 850,000 jews who were expelled from neighboring arab states and israel took all of them in and with the establishment of the state of israel several hundred thousand palestinians uh, either fled or some were expelled and and the arab states took none of them in they established them in refugee camps there's still refugee camps in 2021 in lebanon in jordan in the west bank and and those are the great grandchildren of people who are alive in 1948 i mean that's that's madness those aren't refugees those are people who are born in a particular place and countries don't want to take them in. I mean, Kuwait expelled 300,000 Palestinians in the aftermath of the Gulf War and nobody seemed to notice or care um, because th- this really isn't about the human rights of, of Palestinians. If it were, then the public would care deeply about the fact that Hamas is one of the most repressive and evil terrorist regimes on the planet. It, it isn't about the rights of Palestinians or the human rights of Palestinians. The, the Hamas literally bombed a border crossing this week I'm that was being opened in order to uh, allow aid to flow into to the Gaza Strip sentiment. Uh, and unfortunately, the Palestinian people will get caught in the middle. And even more unfortunately, there are a lot of Palestinians who seem to want to elect terrorist groups in order to effectuate a desire that is that is a fantasy to completely destroy Israel all the way across the board. Uh, as far as the Israeli Arabs, you know, it seems from, from the information that I'm seeing that what you're looking at is um, not a small, but sort of a, a moderate core, uh, a moderately large core of, of Hamas and Fatah sympathizers, but uh, I don't know that that represents the vast majority of Israeli Arabs who seem to want to stay in Israel by every available poll. There are very few polls suggesting that any number of these folks actually want to leave and live under the the, the tender mercies of Fatah or Hamas. They want to stay in Israel and have the same human rights as, as the other Israeli citizens have. Um, and uh, and the unfortunate part of what happened in Lod, obviously, is that it set back a lot of relations that were seeming to, to burgeon. I think this is one of the reasons why Hamas and Fatah did what they did. It's because of the Abraham Accords, because of this kind of growing consensus that Arabs and Jews could actually live together in peace. The Palestinian leadership had to reignite this sort of conflict because otherwise at some point the people might say, well, hold on, why is it that the UAE can live with the Israelis? Why is it that Bahrain can live with the Israelis? Why can Morocco live with the Israelis? And they can get technology and they can do trade and they can participate in economic commerce and we can and, and why can they do all of that and, may, and, and live in better circumstances? But we're right next to these people and we could be starting a business directly across the border with them, but we're not allowed to do that. So instead, the leadership always has to direct all of the internal anger outward at the Jews. Oh, we definitely truly hope so, because, you know, my trainer here is Israeli Arab and, you know, I see him starting his business and, and actually doing very, he's been very successful. And, and, you know, I know many of them want to live side by side with Jews. And it actually relates to the next question I wanted to ask you is about, you know, what is some of the public perception in the U.S. about, you know, this whole operation? And, you know, one thing that's been very weird to us, um, you know, when we look 200 miles to the north, when there's full on genocide in Syria um, and you literally hear nothing about it in the media. And I just read a report and UNRWA and the UN condemned Israel in the last 15 years over 100 times and the rest of the world literally, you know, you look at Zambia and, you know, North Korea, they literally, you know, at this, it's a single digits and, and it's, it's crazy to, to us. So what, what do you think some of the public perception, how, how do you look at it then? So I, I think that the, the public only pays attention to this when there's a conflagration. And that's really the biggest problem, because in order for you to follow what's going on, you really do have to know some history. So there's a giant public perception out there that this whole conflict started in the last three weeks over, over Sheikh Jarrah, or it started over events on the Temple Mount. And in order to really contextualize everything, you kind of have to know the history going back about 3,000 years. That's a lot of history that you actually have to know. And so you'll hear all these slogans that are trotted out that are completely ahistorical. But in order to know that they're not historical, you have to know enough history to know that. So when people will say things like, you know, Israel is a colonialist power, you say, well, I mean, considering the fact that 
Moses left Egypt around 1200 BC and Joshua invaded the land of Canaan in about 1000 BC. And the first temple was built in about 850 BC. And the second temple was built in 515 BCE. And you're, the, the, all of this being more than a thousand years before the rise of Islam, I'm going to have a tough time saying the Jews in Israel is actually a colonial problem. Um, but you, you have to know enough to, to be able to rebut those arguments. And, and people don't. And people don't watch closely. And so they tend to do what a parent does when you walk into a room and you see a couple of kids fighting. right? And instead of trying to know exactly how this got started, especially if they're somebody else's kids. right? It's more like that. You walk into a room, you see a couple of kids who aren't yours fighting. So you have no real stake in the fight. Your first move is separate the combat. I don't care who started it. You both sit down and you both be quiet. And I don't care what the motivations are. And I think for most people who stumble across conflicts like this, that's the way they see it. For people who look at the conflict, like how are you possibly equating Israel attempting what is the most pinpoint military operation I've ever seen in my life? You know, attempting to hit infrastructure, warning people to get out of buildings, hitting terror tunnels, as opposed to killing Hamas leaders on mass. How do you compare that with, with people firing hundreds of rockets indiscriminately into civilian areas, shielding their own rockets with their own civilians, being caught on tape talking about how they want to leave children in buildings so that if the children die, they can use it for propaganda purposes? How do you even compare those two? But if you don't care at all and your complete familiarity with every conflict is whatever you read in The New York Times, which is cycle of violence continues, Israel versus Palestinians, you'll notice how, how little the media like to use the term Hamas in their headlines. Uh, they, they like to say that there's conflict between Israel and the Palestinians broadly writ, as though, as though every attack on Hamas is an attack against the Palestinians, generally speaking, which of course is untrue. Or they'll say Israel attacked Gaza. Is Israel is not attacking Gaza. Israel is attacking Hamas in Gaza. If Israel are attacking Gaza, I promise you, there'd be a lot more dead people than 265 dead people in the most densely populated, I think it's the third most densely populated area on earth. So it's, it's an absurdity. But again, you actually have to care enough to educate yourself about this stuff. And most celebrities don't. They know that their friends are going to, to pat them on the back for saying that the, the more powerful country is to blame. And this goes to sort of a broader argument that you see so much on the political left, which is that if somebody is successful and somebody is unsuccessful, it must be because the successful party somehow did something bad to the person who's unsuccessful. He sees on everything from economics to foreign policy. So in, so in Israel, Israel's a wildly successful company, uh, country rather. It's got extraordinary economic growth. It's got tremendous intellectual capital. It's got all this momentum in terms of military power and technological power. And then the Palestinians have been living under the thumb of a terrorist regime. And so the predictable leftist response is not, well, maybe the problem is the terrorist regime. The predictable leftist response is, look at this one group of people who are very rich and wealthy and doing really well. And this other group of people who are not doing as well, it must be that the people who are doing really well have done something wrong to the people who are not doing very well. So actually from, from what you're saying is, is maybe if I understand you correctly, you think those, so you think from Israel perspective and from PR, obviously, you know, I feel like at least from to a certain extent, I think Israel is losing on the PR, you know, uh, war that we, we're dealing with, whether it's social media and all that sort of stuff. But from hearing you, you think we should be even more proactive in, even in situations where there's not necessarily uh, operation going on and, and we should start to kind of educate people or how would you how would you play that from Israel perspective to kind of to, to try to win that battle of you know the Palestinians always playing on field you know and you see you, those, those sad pictures and Israel is you know the bully and you know a lot of all that sort of stuff yeah I mean the, the biggest mistake that Israel makes is that it's sort of Israel as a country is sort of like let's keep our head down we're working hard let's let's grow and let's see what we need to do and let's not bother about the rest of the world because after all, all we, the, the whole point of Israel is leave us alone, right? Uh, so why should we bother engaging? And then a war breaks out and then there's no sentiment on behalf of Israel, particularly in Europe, um, but also growing on, on the left in the United States. And that's because if, if Israel were to do what it should be doing in terms of PR, it would spend a lot less time defending itself and a lot more time making clear who its enemies are. Politics mm -hmm. is an extraordinarily binary business, right? It's, it's one side or the other side. And Israel, because Israel actually wants to make peace, is constantly attempting not to demonize. Israel is constantly attempting to demonstrate just how forthcoming it is, how much it wants to make a deal, how it's a, how it's a uh, open and honest and, and, and um, liberal country. And that carries exactly zero weight with most people. Uh, w w the, the truth is that um, people have a gut reaction to images that they see. And if the only images that they see in the media are images of Israeli soldiers carrying guns and small Palestinian children sitting on top of, of unexploded ordnance, then people are going to come away with a particular picture. And Israel doesn't bother in the intervening period to actually put out 
information about what it is the Hamas does on a daily basis, what exactly they're doing with their money, how they're subjecting the Palestinians to this horror, how they're firing these rockets. Like, it's, it's, it's amazing to me that, that, that there should be a gut level response. The Israelis have a gut level response. When they hear Hamas, they know a terrorist group, right? right? Right away, you know, there's a terrorist group that wants to murder Jews. When the rest of the world hears Hamas, they don't know anything. And then when the New York Times says Hamas just means Palestinians, they go, oh, it's, it's that conflict. Oh, okay, so this is just gonna keep going on forever and both sides are wrong. And so Israel has, has not done a very good job in making Hamas uh, a household world, word in terms of this is an evil group. And the same thing with Hezbollah, like these should be household words in the same way that Al Qaeda for, for Americans is a household world and word. I mean, Hamas is responsible for American deaths. Al Qaeda is responsible for American deaths. Hezbollah is responsible for an awful lot of American deaths. Uh, the, the fact that, that people don't have any context means that, that the left is able to shape the narrative and, and particularly that the Palestinians are able to shape the narrative. And the Palestinians have never made a case for why the Palestinian Authority or Fatah or Islamic Jihad or Hamas are good. Right? Every single piece of information that they put out is why the Israelis are evil. Meanwhile, the Israelis are like, oh, you know what? The way we'll defend ourselves is we'll show you a picture of a bunch of beautiful Israeli women in bikinis on a beach. Okay, that, that doesn't do any good. I mean, I'm from America. There are lots of beautiful women on beaches. Like that's, that's what we do here, right? <laughs> in Europe, it's the same sort of thing. Like the, the, the question isn't whether Israel is, is, a, is justified in existing, right? That's, that's losing the argument. The question is, is, why should Hamas be justified in existing? It's a terrorist entity. Interesting. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that Israeli PR have done over the years is that they use a lot of times Israelis to do PR here in Israel and in the U.S., which, you know, some, sometimes the, the American people understand PR differently and they should they should talk different language sometimes, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate because, uh, like you said, we need to be proactive. And, you know, it actually also leads to my next question as well, is that, you know, I have many friends who have been on the left for many, many years, um, whether it's here in Israel, but mostly in the U.S., but essentially they're very worried of, of the left becoming much more extreme. And, and we see that now with the next generation, like you, you talked about earlier, Rashida Tlaib, AOC just said today not to sell weapons to Israel, obviously. And do you think what's going to be the end of the progressive uh, movement within the left? Is it going to get to the extreme? You know, how, how do we build a relationship with them going forward? Obviously having, you know, a better relationship with, with the Republicans, but, you know, worrying about what, what's going yeah, on with I mean, the Democrats. It, and so it, it's very difficult because the truth is that really since the 67 war, there's been a sort of slow and then faster move by the left away from Israel. So between 40 and 67, uh, there's a lot of sympathy on the left for Israel because Israel was a small, uh, victimized country. And then Israel won the 67 war and suddenly it was Goliath as opposed to David in the view of the left. And suddenly they were the bad guys. Uh, and, and that also happened to coincide with the Soviet Union deciding to abandon Israel and turn its, its attention to the Arab world in, in an attempt to curry favor, um, which I don't think is coincidental. But in, in terms of the, the Democratic Party throughout the 70s and, and the 80s uh, was at least titularly a pro-Israel party. Uh, even throughout the, the Clinton administration, I didn't think that was a pro-Israel administration, but, but most Democrats thought of themselves as pro-Israel. Uh, now it seems to really be sliding quite fast away from that. Honestly, I think, again, the only way that you can get people not to embrace the enemies of Israel is to make them ashamed of embracing the enemies of Israel. What, mm -hmm. what the left has been so successful in doing is convincing people that they should be ashamed of embracing Israel, not that they should be enthusiastic about embracing the Palestinians, but that they should be ashamed of embracing Israel because Israel is a powerful group. But he says from Sarah Silverman the other day, right? Sarah Silverman tweeted out, there are a bunch of anti-Semitic attacks in the United States. And she tweeted out, we are not Israel and Jews are not Israelis. And, you know, you, and we should be treated differently. And, and I tweeted back at her, like, great, Sarah. So if you just deny Israel's right to defend itself and, and its right to, and its duty to defend its citizens, leave you alone. Which of course right. is idiocy, right? Actually, you know, yeah. We saw it in, we just literally just saw it in LA. A group of Palestinians coming into a, a sushi restaurant while a guy's having a sushi roll and they say, who's Jewish here? And they, they you know, beat him up. It's awful. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, the constant argument that's being made by a lot of anti-Semites on the left is if Israel didn't exist, there'd be less anti-Semitism. They say while well, beating a Jew who's not Israeli, right? Like, it's, it's ridiculous. Right, yeah. like, the, like, like the fact is that, that anti-Semitism has pre-existed the state of Israel. It, it has existed during the state of Israel. The reason that the state of Israel was created on a practical political level is specifically because of anti-Semitism that right. pre-existed the state of Israel. But uh, the, you know, the, the willingness of the left to overlook all of that because of this whole victimization narrative, and you see this very often from, you know, Cori Bush, members of the squad, 
Uh, you know, they'll say things like Black Lives Matter and the Palestinians, it's the same struggle. And you think to yourself, on what level, for what, like, why? That they, they have nothing to do with one another. Forget whether Black Lives Matter is right or wrong. I think that they're wrong. The, the basic idea that these are the same struggle in any way is a bizarre figment of the imagination. Um, but that's what's being pushed. And the only way to push back against that is to say, okay, fine, you want to own that, own it. You're on the side of Hamas. So explain why you should be on the side of Hamas. Explain why Hamas is right to fire rockets into Israel. Explain why Israel doesn't have a duty to defend itself. Uh, explain, explain why you're justifying and waving your hands away at, at what Hamas is doing. And, you know, you want to talk about, you know, eviction processes between private parties and Sheikh Jarrah. That's fine. But you're going to have to explain to me why you're now siding with a genocidal terrorist group that routinely executes people it considers to be informers, that executes gay people, that fires rockets indiscriminately, that protects its rockets with children. Why are you on their side? Like that's you can explain to me why you're not on Israel's side, but I want you to explain why you're on the other side. Yeah, the LGBTQ communities, it's you know behind me how they they stand by Hamas and the Palestinians. When if you're gay in, in Gaza right now, they'll hang you from a tree. Like in in within yeah, it's second. I mean, and the, and the answer unfortunately is that there's a certain intersectional coalition in which Jews are not included because Jews are disproportionately too successful. And then just like Asians are no longer included in the intersectional coalition. Right. And the idea is that there's a group of people who are victimized. If we all get together and we fight back against the system, then we'll gain additional power. And so it's, a, it's an alliance of temporary convenience, but it's very temporary convenience if you're gay and in the Gaza Strip. Ben, before I let you go, I have a, I have a thesis that I've been holding for quite some time now. 2028, you know, is there a chance we'll see an Orthodox Jew running for president? Oh, man. Not me, man. <laughs> That's only a terrible job. That's an awful job. Ugh. You'll be the best president looks terrible. Uh, be, be, uh, being president would be terrible. It, it just looks like a, uh, what a, what a drag. What a, what a, what a terrible job. I, I enjoy my life and I, I like spending time with my wife and children. I mean, I, I watch what the president has to go through on a day, daily level and it's uh, not, not a lot of fun. Thank, thank you so much for your time, Ben. Really appreciate it. I know you, you have a busy day ahead of you. So thank you so much. Hey, thanks really so much. Appreciate your time.